Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. For those who weren't here this morning, I'm Joanne Koob. I'm director of the Liberty and Law Center, um, which in one of our big projects is Voices for Liberty. So thank you for joining us. And I'm really happy to be able to introduce our keynote for this lunch, Jonathan Rausch. Just a little bit about Jonathan. I think most of you probably know, are familiar with his work, but he is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He's the author of eight books and many articles on public policy, culture, and government. His books include The Happiness Curve, Why Life Gets Better After 50, Gay Marriage, Why It Is Good for Gays, Good for Straits, and Good for America, and Kindly Inquisitors, The New Attacks on Free Thought. Kindly Inquisitors defends free speech and robust criticism even when it's racist, sexist, and even when it hurts. And many of us, I'm sure, have read his latest book, The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth, which is a deep diving account of how to push back against disinformation, canceling, and other new threats to our fact-based epistemic order. He is a contributing writer for The Atlantic and recipient of the 2005 National Magazine Award. He's currently at work on his newest project, which is another book about repairing the rift between white evangelical Christianity and democracy. He's written on a huge variety of other topics, including agriculture, economics, biological rhythms, and animal rights, and on a huge variety of venues, including The Economist, Reason, New York Times, New York Daily News, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and Chronicle of Higher Education. He was born and raised in Phoenix, graduated in 1982 from Yale University. And then very interestingly, if you look at his bio on Brookings, apparently he does not like shrimp. I did not find that out until after the menu for today was chosen, and so I was delighted that there was no shrimp that I saw. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, uh, and thank you for having me. It is a real honor. Is everyone seated where they can see a screen, and can we fire up the uh, presentation? And maybe dim the lights a bit. Um, I have about 35 minutes with you and then about another 10 for a conversation with, uh, with each other. I threw you a bit of a curveball here because although I love to sell the constitution of knowledge, that's not specifically what I want to talk to you about today. Um, I, in fact, want to talk about free speech, civil rights, and social progress with an emphasis on social progress because I think we're not talking about it enough in this context. Um, I'd like to start here in this place. Raise your hand if you recognize this scene. Many of you do. This is Silliman College Courtyard at Yale University in 2015. Silliman is basically a dorm. And the man you're seeing there is Nicholas Christakis, a faculty member who is surrounded by angry students who are denouncing uh, free speech on campus. Stop. I don't agree with that. Then, then why the fuck did you accept the position? Because what the fuck hired you? I have a different vision. You should step down. If that is what you think about being a pastor, you should step down. It is not about creating an intellectual space. It is not. Do you understand that? It's about creating a home here. It's about creating a home here. It's not about creating an intellectual space. Now, it's tempting to dismiss this as a tantrum of a spoiled student, but I, I don't think we should. The point being made here is actually a pretty profound and serious one, which is that speech can be harmful, especially in a community, and the community has not only the right but the obligation to regulate that so that the people in the community, even if it's a university, should feel comfortable. This is a principle which is almost, not quite, but almost universally held to one degree or another at students at elite institutions across America. I gathered, for example, these quotations from student manifestos at various elite institutions. Um, 
and highlighted some of the phrases that they use because they're pretty typical. Free speech, says students at Claremont, has given those who seek to perpetuate systems of domination a platform to project their bigotry. Middlebury students say free speech puts undue burden on specific groups of students, asking them to continually defend their right to exist in an academic community for the supposed intellectual enrichment of that same community. And from Williams College, an ideology of free speech absolutism that prioritizes ideas over people, giving deeply offensive language a platform at this institution will inevitably imperil marginalized students. So those are the ideas, harms, discrimination, perpetuation of racism, um, imperiling marginalized students. Raise your hand if you have in your own personal lives on campus um, encountered these ideas and arguments. So I would say that's actually at least half the room, maybe more. Now this leads to some pretty peculiar results in a uh, university context. Here's just one example. There's an infinity of them, of course. But this was the cancellation of a talk by an author of a book about the KKK. It was an anti-racist book. Nonetheless, students said that just to discuss the KKK was a form of violence. And these ideas are also seeping now into the actual conduct of research, scholarship, and science. This is Dorian Abbott. Some of you may know him. He's a geophysicist at the University of Chicago. He was set to give a scientific lecture at MIT on the subject of exoplanetary biology, but that talk was canceled because he had written a Newsweek article uh, making the case against preferential um, admissions. Now, the subject of admissions criteria and exoplanetary biology have absolutely nothing in common Yet he was deemed unsuitable to give a scientific lecture because of that political view. More recently, prestigious journal Nature Human Behavior uh, put forth new editorial standards just last year. I won't read through all of this, but essentially, they say that if they deem a scientific paper or publication to be harmful, even inadvertently, to a minority group, they won't publish it. They say science has for too long been complicit in perpetuating structural inequalities and discrimination in society. With this guidance, we take a step towards countering this, regardless of content type. In other words, for everything they publish, editors can correct, amend, refuse publication, or retract post-publication to submissions that embody singular privileged perspectives, whatever those are. What this is doing is gatekeeping science on the basis of social harms. Here is another offshoot of this mentality. Um, this is a chart that shows the percentage of people in different categories in academia who openly acknowledge discriminating against right-leaning papers, grants, and promotions. And I, uh, I put a box around PhDs, grad students. These tend to be the most radicalized, and that does not augur all that well for our future. And what you see there is that a quarter of them openly acknowledge discriminating against conservatives in paper submissions, and a third of them discriminate in grant bids. Among academics on the far left, you see it's 12% and 20%. Now, we can be pretty sure, I think, that because this is the group that openly acknowledges discriminating in their scholarly work against conservatives, that the actual number is higher. And then you've got figures like this. This is the percentage of college students saying that they think that their school's intellectual or social climate stifles free expression. You see that trending steadily upward between 2016 and 2021. It remains about two thirds today. That's unfortunate in institutions whose raison d'etre is supposed to be the robust and open discussion of ideas. Here's the national number. This is fresh off the press. July 2023, 67% of Americans say the political climate prevents them from saying things, I believe, because others might find them offensive. And here's a comparison of self-censorship, chilling, 
uh, in the modern era versus the early 1950s, just past the peak of the McCarthy period. And you see, to the best, it's hard to make these comparisons, but it looks like there's about three times as much chilling today. And that's not as surprising as you might think when you reflect that in 19. 54, you knew what not to say to stay out of trouble. You know, if you were not a pinko or a commie, you were probably okay. In 2023, you never know what to say because constant renorming and thought policing makes sure you don't know what to say. This inspires neurotic self-policing and, and chilling. So this is not a great climate, but we need to go to the roots of the problem and understand that it is a coherent and compassionate attempt to protect minorities against civil rights violations and other harms. How do we talk about this? Well, here's the main way. John Stuart Mill, Oliver Wendell Holmes, in his famous uh, uh, simile in Abrams versus US, the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, the marketplace of ideas. I am second to none in my admiration for John Stuart Mill and his arguments. I'm going to submit that they're not enough. Here I just show you, we won't discuss, but these are, I think, the four big arguments that we make and that I have made for years now when I travel to campuses making the case for free speech. Uh, and you know them all. They are first the argument from knowledge. This is Mill's argument that the person who does not know the other side of the case does not know even his own where there can be no offense, there can be no errors, no hypotheses, no imagination, and no learning. The second, basic human freedom. Dissent and free thought is a fundamental right. We cannot thrive without it. And third is efficacy. We have here one of the most compelling um, proponents uh, of, of the notion that censorship backfires. That's Nadine Strossen, who's written a whole book about it. She has pages in that book of why this never works. And fourth, the argument about authority, which is who are you going to trust to police your speech? And the answer is, it's not a good idea to trust anyone to police your speech. Well, I go from campus to campus, and I make these points, and they're important points, and I'm not saying don't talk about them. I am saying they're water off a duck's back. If you're talking to students who say, well, that may all be well and good in theory, but I am a minority student, and I should not have to be here and hear my right to exist challenged. I should not have to hear hate speech. I should not be a target here in my home. So there is something else that we need to talk more about, and it's, it's this, justice, social justice. Justice specifically for the minorities and the marginalized. We need to tell them that story. Now, um, one doesn't need to take my word for it. Here's a name that has already come up in this morning's session. The second greatest American, I think, of the 19th century. Fierce, articulate advocate for freedom of speech. One of the greatest. Slavery cannot tolerate free speech. Five years of its exercise would banish the oxen block and break every chain in the South. He also points out equally clear is the right to hear. To suppress free speech is a double wrong. It violates the rights of the hearer, as well as those of the speaker. A lot of Americans don't know that Frederick Douglass made these points. Now, he made them in the context of having been violently canceled in Boston only shortly before. John Lewis, great civil rights leader. Without freedom of speech and the right to dissent, the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings. Or here's a special favorite. This is from the documentary Mighty Ira about the former ACLU president, Ira Glasser. Um, this is, uh, well, let, let's let him tell it. I was on a Donahue show once with Hosea Williams. Ira Glasser. Who we were discussing the rights of the Klan. He was on that show ostensibly to debate me about it. And he surprised everybody. Head of the uh, United States Civil Rights Commission. Well, Phil, one thing we must understand, uh, a right is not a right in America until it's extended to every American. And even though they beat and brutalize us in seeking that right, yeah. If they take the Ku Klux Klan off the cable today, the NSA, they go, NAACP is next. They're going to take the NAACP you off tomorrow. So? I was Dr. King's field general. I, I organized every major march. The problem with the black struggle in America has been black leaders like King didn't have the ability to communicate with the masses. 
Once that ability to communicate with the masses, things change. Not enough people have heard those voices. Uh, but now I want to switch gears and talk about how all of this has impacted me and the people I know and the people I love. And I'm going to tell you a story that I think precious few Americans have heard. This is the cover of one magazine. Anyone ever heard of this? Nigel, anybody else? Nadine? Oh, uh, uh, thanks, we've, well, we've got a few here. That's refreshing because I hadn't heard that, heard of one until actually comparatively recently in my life. One was the first intellectual journal about homosexuality in America. It was founded around 1953 or 1954. In one of its very first issues, it made the case for same-sex marriage. It published literary articles and poetry and essays and the like. There was nothing the least bit pornographic about it. It was almost instantly censored by the US Postal Service, which deemed it obscene. Now in the 50s, the only way you could spread your message if you were a magazine was through the mail. There was really no other route. So there were repeated tussles with the US uh, Postal Service in the person of the Los Angeles Postmaster General, a man named Oleson. And then finally, there was this issue, headlined, You Can't Print It, which was an attack on the Postal Service's censorship rules. And guess what? This issue was censored. What a coincidence. Surprising that that ever happened. One took to the courts. Here were the results. At the district court level, uh, the judge ruled, the suggestion advanced that homosexuals should be recognized as a segment of our people and be accorded special privilege as a class is rejected. Notice the reframing here. Uh, to be a minority demanding your rights is a special privilege. The US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit outdid the district court, referring to cheap pornography, dirty, vulgar, and offensive to the moral senses, obscene and filthy, lewd and lascivious. Social standards are fixed by and for the great majority and not by or for a hardened or weakened minority. Uh, and that's true. When you have censorship and other such standards, they will be fashioned for the great majority against minorities. Then something unexpected happened. 1958, case got to the Supreme Court and it issued a ruling in one incorporated versus Oleson. Uh, here is the ruling. Now this is not the cover page of the ruling or the digest. This is the entire ruling. The petition uh, for certiorari is granted and the judgment of the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit is reversed. 9-0, that's the whole opinion per curiam. I think actually they should do a lot more of these. <laughs> and notice um, Eric Jolber for the petitioner. He's the volunteer lawyer who wrote the original article criticizing the censorship and then represented one all the way up through. He was a volunteer, he was straight. This is not ancient history, folks. Here he is. Um, this is him receiving an award. He just died last year. This guy was you know, still around. Uh, this is not the distant past. One versus Oleson gave us our voice. For the first time, homosexuals were free to express ourselves. 1958, at the same time as 1 v. Oleson, something happens to this man. Raise your hand if, if you know him. Keep your hand up if you knew him personally. So this is Frank Kameny, the most important gay civil rights leader of the previous century. He lived here in Washington. There's a street named after him now, and he's well known to local residents. Kameny uh, fought in World War II. He was a combat veteran in Italy, and he went on to become a PhD astronomer at Harvard, a brilliant scientist, worked for the US Army Map Service, but caught up in the Lavender Scare, in which hundreds, thousands, we still don't really know how many homosexuals were fired from the government under an Eisenhower 
executive order that said homosexuals uh, were perverts and could not serve. He was one of those people, and we'll let him tell the story. And uh, as was mentioned, I had a position as an astronomer with the what was then called the Army Map Service uh, here in uh, Washington. And uh, one day, the I was called in by two Civil Service Commission investigators. They said, we have information that leads us to believe that you're homosexual. Do you have any comment? I said, what's the information? They said, we can't tell you. I said, well, then I can't comment. And in any case, it's none of your business. I was fired. I proceeded to appeal uh, all the way up to, uh, I follow routes all the way. So I appealed through the Civil Service Commission and on up, they addressed an executive branch agency all the way up to the White House without success, to the House and Senate uh, civil service uh, committees without success, and eventually, with the help of the ACLU, went to court. Most homosexuals who were fired in that era slunk away because they were pariahs, they were shamed, often their friends and family would turn on them, their professional connections would be severed, they would be fired from their job. Frank Kameny would never have a job again as a result of that firing. He died in penury, he had no money, he had no national following, but he had something that was quite unusual, a voice, voice like a foghorn, and a willingness to use it. Here is the kind of response he met. Uh, he found something called the Mattachine Society of Washington, which um, its successor organization still exists today. Uh, this is when he demands a meeting with the Civil Service Commission over his firing. You can see uh, that John W. Macy, remember that name, we'll be coming back to it, the chairman of the commission says it is the established policy of the Civil Service Commission that homosexuals are not suitable for appointment to or retention in positions in the federal service. There would be no useful purpose served in meeting with representatives of your society. In other words, jump in a lake. Here's the kind of response he got to his campaign before Congress, which involved a lot of letter writing and a lot of appeals. Um, your letter of August 28th has been received, says a member of Congress, and in reply, <clears throat> may I state unequivocally that in all my six years of service in the United States Congress, I have not received such a revolting communication. He, um, with the ACL's, ACLU's help, he goes through the courts, um, he decides, against their advice, to appeal to the Supreme Court. The ACLU pulls out at that point because they don't want an adverse decision, the perfectly rational thing to do. Frank, of course, being Frank, does not pull out. And he writes the first gay rights brief that ever appears before the high court. And here are two other points he makes. In World War II, Petitioner did not hesitate to fight the Germans with bullets in order to help preserve his rights and freedoms and liberties and those of others. In 1960, it is ironically necessary that he fight the Americans with words in order to preserve against a tyrannical government some of those same rights, freedoms, and liberties for himself and others. Note the emphasis on words. That's what he's got, his voice. Remember, at this point, this is a very, very isolated human being. He goes on to say, the commission's regulation as it stands is unconstitutional in that by establishing a tyranny over the mind of its citizen, it is inconsistent with and violates the provision, stipulation, spirit, and intent of the First Amendment to the federal constitution. I highlighted over the mind there because Kameny understands the stakes. Now this is an employment discrimination case. He wants his job back, he's been fired. But those are not the stakes he presents to the courts. He says this is tyranny over the mind. This is thought control. This is an effort to bend the very thinking of all America to render people like Frank Kameny invisible and unthinkable and deplorable. Kameny does not stop. He and the Madison Society and some other activists organized in 1965 the first gay civil rights protest. Here they are in front of the White House, you can see just off to the right there, a somewhat bemused Washington, D.C. police officer. They went on a couple of days later to stage the same kind of protest in front of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. <clears throat> they understood their symbolism. 
you can see they're all dressed in their Sunday best. This was before the Pride movement came along, which was, <clears throat> can we say, not necessarily Sunday best, a different philosophy. And you can see that the signs that they're, that they're holding there are very substantive. Um, here's Frank. You can see he's second from the front there. He doesn't stop. He continues to represent dozens of people who were fired by the government. In 1971, he becomes the first openly homosexual candidate for Congress, running for the DC delegate slot. Actually, quite a credible campaign. He gets some praise from the Washington Post editorial board. First big change, this is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This is the Bible of the psychiatric profession. And in this edition, homosexuality is a mental illness. Uh, this has been the excuse for barbaric treatments of homosexuals that included, in some occasions, lobotomies, um, shock therapy, the awful, awful thing that happened to, to um, Alan Turing in Britain, and, of course, just tons of misery from people like me who grew up thinking if I was gay, I was mentally ill. Due to the, Frank, by the way, Frank, remember, was a scientist due to his efforts and those of others. But here in Washington, D.C., they take the stage in 1971 at the APA conference. And Frank Kameny denounces the assembled psychiatric great and good in America of leading a holocaust, a genocide against homosexuals. In 1973, the APA rescinds its diagnosis of homosexuality as a disease. Kameny calls it the greatest mass cure in American history and is probably right. He campaigned for years against sodomy laws. 1993, the DC uh, District of Columbia repealed its, its sodomy law. That was, he sometimes said, his proudest accomplishment as a resident of DC. Um, in 19, uh, I'm, I got out of order, but in 1975, I couldn't find a slide for this. Weirdly, there are no clips. The US Civil Service Commission rescinds its ban on homosexual employees. One of the commissioners calls up Kameny and says, OK, you win. 1995, this is pretty recently, guys, right? 1995, the Clinton administration finally ends the ban on security clearances for gay workers, which means that someone like Frank Kameny working in a secure environment can keep his job. We get into the current century. The nice thing about Frank's story, the reason it's so moving to tell, I rarely get through it dry-eyed, is he lives until 2011. So he lives long enough to be handed the pen by Barack Obama when President Obama signs an executive order granting some protections to LGBT federal employees. Those signs you saw are today in the Smithsonian Museum of American History. Here's one of them being displayed next to um, two of them, actually, next to Muhammad Ali's boxing gloves. My favorite moment, um, and the one I can never get through without at least a little bit of emotion, the Office of Personnel Management was the renamed US Civil Service Commission, the agency that had fired Frank Kameny in 1958. Kameny lived long enough to receive the Theodore Roosevelt Medal, which is the agency's highest award and a formal apology 51 years later from the agency for his firing. Uh, and here you can see him accepting it. My favorite bit about all this is that the man there to the left in the picture is John Barry, the director of the agency. And he is, can anyone guess the adjective I'm about to use? Anyone know? Openly? Homosexual, he's gay. Pretty wonderful. This happens in one man's lifetime. Um, it's Frank describing it. The reference here that we've seen earlier at the bottom of that letter was to John W. Macy, the Civil Service Commissioner who refused to meet with him. The Civil Service Commission changed, had its name changed, is now the Office of Personnel Management and uh, uh, directed by an openly gay man 
Mr. Macy of the Civil Service Commission back then must be turning over in his grave. Oh, how I wish he were alive to see that. <laughs> oh, how I wish he were here. I mentioned that one magazine advanced the idea of gay marriage in the 50s. In 1970, a gay couple went to the Hennepin County Courthouse in Minnesota, near Minneapolis, and attempted to take out a marriage license, discovering that there was no law against it. Marriage then recedes for a while, but the AIDS epidemic comes along, and thousands of gay Americans discover that they are legally complete strangers to the loves that they are trying to take care of. They can't get into the hospital rooms. They have no rights of survivorship. And the gay marriage movement takes off. In 1995, well, actually the early 90s, I recognized this as the cause of my life. I still remember vividly uh, being on a walk with my father and telling him in 1995, fall of 95, I'm about to get involved in this publicly as a journalist. And he warned me against that. He was not homophobic. He didn't mind that I was gay. But he said, this is such a, such a crazy idea. He said that I would marginalize myself and ruin my career in journalism. I just wouldn't be taken seriously. And at the time, that seemed quite possible. As with Frank Kameny in the 50s and 60s, the gay marriage movement had virtually no public support. It had no money. It had no constituency. It just had a group of diseased pariahs, or sometimes not diseased pariahs, in a desperate situation demanding equality and human rights. So thanks to the room that Frank Kameny and others carved out, I wrote about same-sex marriage at every opportunity. I wrote a book about it. I wrote articles. I would speak whenever I could. I never turned down a debate opportunity, no matter who it was against. Now, this is not all that long ago. I concede I looked a lot younger. But this is really not very long ago. And in 2010, we are in the um, District of Columbia Courthouse, and that's me and Michael Lai, who was here until a few minutes ago, getting married. Under and by the virtue of the authority conferred upon me as branch chief of the Superior Court of the District of Columbia, by the Congress of the United States of America, I now pronounce you legal man. Congratulations. You know what to do now. <laughs> Thank you. That is indeed a wonderful moment. Five years later, our marriage became legal throughout the country, and only last year in the defense, uh, and, excuse me, the Respect for Marriage Act, Congress made it federal law. This is within one generation, less than one generation, a transformation in social justice in our society. There's a lot to say about it, and I do say a lot about it. When I go talk to college campuses, I make at least some of these five points, and I'll load you up with them now before going on to the real takeaway that I want to suggest for today. But here are some points that we need to make. First, hate speech is a problem. It is harmful. It is divisive, and so forth. But the problem is not the speech, it's the hate. Trying to deal with hate speech by banning, excuse me, trying to deal with hate by banning hate speech is like trying to deal with global warming by breaking all the thermometers. We need to be able to see the speech. We need, need to be able to refute it and rebut it. Frank Kameny never tried to shut down debate on the other side. Rather, he used all the bigotry which he constantly received as an opportunity to platform himself with his better arguments. I was present on one of those occasions. Um, second, the comparison that words are violence. People say, actually, it's not a comparison. They say, literally, words are violence because words can hurt. We must not let that stand because minorities, like homosexuals, know what actual violence is. There is a difference between words and violence. If someone calls me a fucking faggot with words, I can reframe that as the person saying that he or she needs psychiatric help. 
if they say that homosexuality is a treatable disease or that homosexuality is um, intrinsically disordered, you all know what that last one is, that's Catholic catechism right now, today. I can frame that as a devastating insult to me or I can reframe that as, you know, I need to do some educating here. We need to have a conversation. When someone smashes me on the head with a two by four, I do not get a choice about whether to reframe the cracks in my skull. Nor did Salman Rushdie get a choice about whether to keep that eye when he was stabbed in the eye by an activist trying to silence him. We must never allow the comparison, the direct comparison of words and violence to stand because the progress of knowledge and freedom itself depends on being able to voice dissent. Dissent will cause offense, offense will be regarded as violence, Violence is a human rights offense, so by that chain of logic, being offensive violates human rights. Third, don't protect us. The notion that homosexuals and minorities are fragile flowers, that we're weak, that we need to be protected, that we need to run to mommy in the form of the federal government or the college administration is patronizing. Frank Kameny did not need protecting from words. John Lewis, Martin Luther King, um, Frederick Douglass, none of them needed protecting from words. And when you think about it, the stories that are told by majorities to dominate and oppress minorities almost invariably include a story about the weakness or the infirmity of the minority group. So blacks should be enslaved and then the victims of segregation because they are too childlike and mentally infirm to look after themselves. So we're doing them a favor. Women, the weaker sex, the softer sex, they need to be looked after by men. Homosexuals, what were the words that were used? Limp wrist, sissy, pansy. We were soft, we were effeminate, we were targets, uh, we were weak. You noticed in that previous court decision, the judge said a weak minority, that's what he meant. He meant that we were, we were a bunch of pansies. Again and again, the idea of weakness is used to oppress minorities and keep us down. And the last thing minority activists should be doing is embracing those stereotypes of victimhood. I actually favor, some people are surprised by this, some colleges have bias incident reporting systems which are often used as secret informing. I am for bias incident reporting systems, but the way mine works is if you're biased against me, you come and tell me, report it to me, and we'll have a conversation. It will be civil, but I won't shrink from it. Fourth, one of the things you heard in this student rhetoric, minorities should not have the burden of constantly having to explain themselves or justify their existence. They have a point, in an ideal world that would not be necessary. It was not exactly fun for me and a lot of other people like me to go door to door across America saying, oh, please, Mr. Straight Person, can we get married too, just like you? Can't we be as good? There is something humiliating and demeaning about that. But what I would ask these students to remember is that minorities, people on the edge of society, are always the first to see injustice. Social progress comes from the margins. And yes, it is a burden to be in the position of calling out injustice and educating society, but this is also a gift. Working on the cause of equality and social justice has been the greatest privilege of my career. It has provided meaning in my life and, as you can see, incredible results. So my message to these students is embrace the opportunity to change your society, embrace the burden, and finally, maybe to me personally most important, I am old enough, born in 1960, to know firsthand that canceling was invented and refined on homosexuals. If it was known that you were homosexual, not only could you be officially fired from your job, arrested, run in the, uh, your name would run in the newspaper, but society would turn its back, you would become unemployable, in many businesses, your colleagues, your coworkers, your friends, even your family would turn its back on you. You were isolated and shamed and excluded. That happened to us 
for generations and to see minority rights activists turn around now, LGBT activists, especially, alas, in the trans rights movement, embrace many of those same tactics against the people we disagree with is just wrong. We were not fighting for the right and the ability to turn the tables and make the other side suffer as we did. We were fighting for the right for all Americans to live out and express their authentic identities, especially where we disagree with it. And we in the minority rights community need to be framing that as our message. But the main thing I want to leave you with, we need to be saying this, especially the minorities among us. Minorities are always better off in a society that protects hate speech than in a society that protects us from hate speech. And the way we need to make that case is something that I don't think we've done enough of, but that many of the people in this room can do. We need to tell these stories. People in America generally, and especially people under 30 in America, don't know the stories I've told you. They have vague ideas about gay liberation, and they, they think the way it unfolded was oppression, 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 stonewall, liberation, liberation, liberation. Guys, that's not how it happened. It happened because people without money, followings, political clout, or anything else use their voices. Telling the stories of Frank Kameny and John Lewis and the many feminist activists and the others, that's got to start now. I think it's only suitable to let Frank Kameny have the last word. Here we are now. You heard the, pre the presidential proclamation, the very idea back then that the president would actually say something like that, that he would have a reception to, uh, to celebrate Gay Pride Month, uh, would, ha would have been unthinkable. So we have moved ahead over the last almost exactly half a century um, from uh, the depths of ignominy to uh, well, we have a way to go yet, but to off, <laughs> but, but, but to awfully close, I mean, a meeting like this in a government building <laughs> would have been inconceivable, absolutely inconceivable. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, all of you. We have a few minutes for conversation. I'd love to hear your perspectives, especially from some of the younger folks in the room who are here on campus and maybe confronting some of these issues. Uh, sir. Thank you, Jonathan. I always enjoy hearing you talk. Um, how do you feel about economic boycotts as a form of cancellation? I'm thinking perhaps most recently of, uh, of the Budweiser Light uh, campaign. I think they're usually stupid. And they probably backfire and draw more attention to, uh, to dumb people. So, you know, generally, I, I don't favor them. I certainly grant that people have every right not to, not to do business with, with different groups for different reasons. Um, but honestly, I don't think they serve much of a purpose, and they tend to go on much too long. You know, people were still boycotting Coors in the gay community years after it had become a leader and donating to and supporting gay rights causes. So yeah, I, 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 pretty, much, um, I pretty much don't like it. Yeah, let's do you both one, since the mic's there. Great. Um, Are you a student here? Yes, yeah, I'm a student here. Um, and so in a lot of my experience, both at, in law school and in, as an undergraduate, I think. Where were you in undergrad? Northwestern mm -hmm. in uh, Chicago. I think a, lot, a common critique people have against your viewpoint would be the idea that having like this open debate legitimizes the views of the people who hold the hate speech position, right? So if someone is allowed to expound racist ideology, that, that you know, puts that on the same level as me talking about uh, an anti-racist ideology, and it allows people to view those as equal. And maybe they're not deserving of equal treatment. Now, that's not something I personally agree with,
but how do you respond to kind of that critique? I can't resist asking, how do you respond? I would say that the best way to show that the position is not equal is not to censor it, but to present you know, the arguments for why your position is correct. I guess like to win the intellectual debate, but I think there's less, I think people are less receptive to that intellectual debate now. Well, that's a very good thing to say, which I completely support. Another is to point out that truly marginalized uh, minorities don't have the ability to deplatform people who say hateful things. If, if you'd propose to Frank Kameny that he simply uh, take all the Baptist preachers off the air on Sundays, he would have scoffed at you. Um, so the people who most need the help aren't in a position to do deplatforming. And the third point to make is that actually deplatforming has the opposite of what's the intended effect. We know this just for example, as Nadine writes in her wonderful book, um, Hate, uh, Nazi Germany, People for, I'm sorry, the Weimar Republic, people don't seem to realize had strict laws against anti-Semitic hate speech. Um, and the result of those laws is that the Nazis very cleverly use them to get themselves to trials where they platform themselves. And the Nazis plastered Germany with uh, posters saying, what is it that the authorities don't want you to hear? So for all of those reasons, the best answer is to let the stupid people marginalize themselves, which usually, actually, they will do. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Thank you for coming today. Um, so first I wanna thank you for your work. Kindly Inquisitors is probably one of the most formative books of my life. One of the most. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, we, we can't be You'll be, be delighted to know that I went back and forth with a sociology professor at the time about it who was trying to get me to put my hand oh, down in class you. more often. Are, are you a professor here? Uh, no, sir, I'm a student here. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I, I see, what do you think about canceling the cancelers? So there's, in, I've spent some time in the free speech movement and I feel this hesitance among many classical liberals, civil libertarians, especially left libertarians, to use the judicious violence of the state to enforce the liberal order, right? People don't wanna to go to court, people kinda of hesitate to, what it, if people don't wanna use violent rhetoric or get too aggressive or go tit for tat, we don't wanna get dragged down in the culture war, all these kinds of sentiments. I think that's an enormous mistake. Um, you know, the whole point of getting a district court uh, to, to stop a government censor at the FCC, I don't see any difference between that and using a position at the Department of Education to eliminate somebody's job whose it is to, uh, like some DEI dean to like redline grants and, and look for um, certain civil justice shibboleths or whatever. I mean, I think those people, you, it, they're both censors, right? But there's this kind of strange idea in the movement now that government paid bureaucrats have free speech rights on state funded campuses to advance these ideas and propagandize. How would you respond to that? Well, there are a couple of things there. And one is, for example, the role of university administrators um, um, and what they can and, should, can and sh what they should and should not say on behalf of the university. There I am a supporter of what are called the Calvin Principles, which come out of the University of Chicago in the 1960s and which say that university administrators speaking in that capacity should be scrupulously neutral on controversial political issues except those that directly affect the administration of the university. So deans should not be putting out, as one did on Princeton on stationery, a point of view about Black Lives Matter. On the larger question about canceling the cancelers, predictably, I am against it. Um, I want to ratchet down the whole environment where it is a contest between the left and the right or whoever to see who can most successfully repress the other side. That's going to drive society into a spiral of chilling, which we're currently seeing. The Chris Rufo argument is that, well, the left is so embedded on campuses right now that we must use the power of the state and the force of the law uh, to prevent that. If there is one thing that I fear more than the social power of counselors to manipulate environments like universities to silence large numbers of people and chill discourse, it is the power of the government to use criminal law to throw people in jail, like teachers in Florida, professors, school teachers. Right now in Florida, books are being removed from libraries and classrooms all across the state because of criminal penalties about exposing students, including in grade 12, people who are about to be adults 
to ideas that include uh, lesbian and gay or trans content, trans, um, excuse me, trans content. Um, so the cancel wars, I, I think they need to end. And I think the way we move forward is for liberals, small L liberals, classical liberals, um, you know what I mean, on all sides of the political divide to step forward, make ourselves heard, and make some of the arguments I've heard today. I think probably Joanne's presence here means that our time is up. Is that right? That's right, unfortunately. I'm, s I'm sorry we can't go a little longer. I'd love to hear from more of you, but I'm so grateful that you were willing to hear from me. Um, so just housekeeping item, we have a 10 minute break and then we are back in the auditorium. Um, so please use your time wisely and head to the auditorium. <laughs>